Welcome to the Greg Thompson Sports Show Cover One Buffalo Crossover Event. Really excited to have everybody here tonight. And it's a special night because, you know, we, we've been really excited about this, put some tweets out about a special guest joining. And I, I couldn't be happier than to welcome on our special guest. Wait, it's Aaron Quinn. I, I, I thought Adam Schefter was coming on with me. I, I'm, I'm confused about what's going on here. Wait, you're on mute. Ah, see, look at that. I'm a yes. guest on a new show. I don't know how to do stuff. Uh, I heard you got some flack on that tweet a little bit because people <laughs> thought you were for real tweeting news or something. I was at a school dance and uh, missed it a little bit, so I just got home and set up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry that that happened to you. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> for, for everyone who's joining, um, I did in, in every week of the show, I've put out tweets from dolly parton and from uh jay billis and from dick vitale and uh from the dalai lama um from a lot of different people uh and had some fun with it, it you know we, we've had a good time with it usually like oh i can't wait to watch the greg Thompson set sports show um and tonight i did it i i said i did one from adam Schefter saying breaking huge bills mafia news incoming on the greg Thompson set sports show tonight when aaron quinn joins um that is which, good news for some I, people, there's yeah. a new, niche of people that would like to hear about that. Yeah. Um. So, I apologize if if people joined thinking that Adam Schefter, who who works for ESPN and and his ten million followers, were directing you to come watch my wonderful, lovely show to get breaking news that he could have broken. I I I apologize. I I I am I feel terrible that I misled you. Um, but, uh, here we are, you, you have Aaron we can and I break some news and yeah, yeah. We can, uh, break some Buffalo bills news here yeah. as we, uh, yeah, as we get ready. We'll see. Hopefully that's my, uh, my, been my hope all day here is I did a spaces oh, earlier really with, uh, Chris Kepner, uh, Joe DeRosa popped in, uh, tilt money was in there. It was a fun spaces. And all we talked about obviously was Hopkins. And I was like, it's either, I want this news to either pop while we're in spaces or pop tonight, uh, when I'm going live with Greg. So I, I, I do have Twitter open. If you see me scrolling a little distracted, that's okay. Um, I'm waiting for it to pop. And then this will be a much better show that'll yeah, carry I, the show. I don't think I can carry it tonight. Yeah. I will say if, um, and we're obviously going to talk about DeAndre Hopkins quite a bit tonight. Um, I'm going to go through some of the different pieces of what the Bills would have to do uh, to make room for it. Aaron and I will talk about how impactful we think it could or would would or would not be. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other moves that have happened this week as well. Um, but if that happens tonight, I can guarantee it's going to be good content because we are going to say so many inappropriate things like live and in the moment um, that getting our live reaction has a decent chance of going viral. So I if anybody wants to root for anything... Yeah, let's <laughs> hopefully we don't get the channel closed down. Uh, it'd be so interesting. Bill's content creator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see with the, uh, where, where that goes. But um, let's start and go through a few of the things that did happen uh, early on this week. And one, it was. After last week, obviously started out not nothing crazy. We saw Connor McGovern sign. We saw Deontay Hardy sign. Um, you know, pretty you know careful. A lot of small little restructures and things like that. Then we saw the bigger ones with Josh Allen and Von Miller. Um, a lot of things happened pretty much right in line with uh, what our salary cap spectacular lined out. Like pretty much checked every box mm -hmm. of what we said should be anticipated to happen. We saw our man Jordan Poyer come back. All pretty normal things. But the Deontay Hardy one, I know, you know, you talked about in our, our show last week that that certainly seemed to be an indicator. And one of the first things we saw coming into this week was the release of Isaiah McKenzie. Yeah, I mean, to be expected, especially with the bonus kicking in uh, and uh, right Brandon before Bean's, the bonus kicked in. Yeah, right before the bonus kicked in. Brandon being pretty open about that in the press conference when asked about it. Uh, you saw the writing on the wall there. This to me, I tweeted it out, Greg, and we'll talk about some of the other guys here that that Bills brought in. It, none of this is sexy, but it is like 
just small enough minor upgrades where you're switching over to a more ascending, more upside player uh, at these positions that are wide receiver four, that are rotational interior offensive linemen. It doesn't seem like it matters now, but it will matter. Uh, incremental progress is still progress. And when you are a top team and you have a good roster, that incremental progress is the things that are going to get you closer to getting over that hump. So I don't think they're there yet. There's still a lot of time and ways to add, but I love these small like it doesn't seem like much, but I think it will pay dividends during the season where you're just upgrading just a little bit on guys that are going to have a small but still percentage of your snaps throughout the regular season. Yeah. So, you know, we, we talked about it. I don't think that Deontay Hardy is some, you know, hidden game breaker. We did see some of the really interesting efficiency numbers mm -hmm. that showed that when he does touch the ball, there's reason for some excitement. But yeah. we said that he's a notable upgrade or improvement from uh you know from Isaiah McKenzie but it certainly did make it redundant in you know having him still on the roster or whether he was going to be there or not so you know i think being in a position where you know you could move on from him you have a bit of an upgrade i think that's you know a positive it's not a big deal um i think we both tried to be relatively gracious about it both of us were pretty vocal about that yeah. you know it, he his time was coming and we anticipated this but i'm not gonna take joy in somebody getting released from a team i'm glad he caught on with the colts i know he was a fan favorite i know a lot of people liked him i wish him all the best i'm happy that we upgraded and i'm ready to move on um the next ones that we saw were two moves on monday um one was another receiver trent mm -hmm. Sherfield, and i thought that was a pretty similar um move as long as people were on the right page and i know I'll, I'll let you talk about being on the right page of what the move means on this next one um that trent Sherfield to me was just a clean jake kumaro upgrade it, to me he was actually even i was joking with the guys from air raid hour that he's going to be called the roster coupon because he's if you took taiwan jones right and kumaro and made them one player because yeah. he's a pretty high level gunner and he's a depth wide receiver and a four phase special teams guy who can play all the different pieces of special teams, but can also be that gunner. And when he comes on the field and plays receiver, he's actually a functional wide receiver. Again, he's not some hidden superstar. He's not some player that we crack the code and they, oh my gosh, we're going to unleash this offensive weapon, but he's a legit NFL wide receiver. And if you can have a guy instead of a Taiwan Jones, where you and I, you know, you, you had been a huge advocate of his. I was a big supporter that kept kind of coming down year by year. It got to the point now where he only had special teams contributions. And even those were went from exceptional to pretty good. And now if we can have a guy who's really good in that role and when he steps on the field on offense, if you need him for some snaps is actually decent and productive. That's really good efficiency in roster management. Yeah. For me, the Tywan Jones thing, uh, what, when he first came in, the special teams was needed, right? Yeah. You were revamping that special teams. You were trying to get leaders in that side of the ball to show everybody how to do it. So th that was where the interest in him and it did slowly start to <laughs> decrease as the years went on, but that's because the roster got better, right? And now you're in a position where if you can get a player like Sherfield, where you can have that role of, hey, if somebody gets hurt, if uh, Khalil Shakir is down, you can have somebody come up. And it, that's not a significant drop off from where Khalil Shakir is right now. It's what we've seen from Trent Sherfield in his limited role, right? So it's all about creating a floor for yourself. And it gives you the flexibility on game day. This is going to be a very difficult roster for uh, Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott to work out this game yep. day actives and stuff like that going into this next year. I I'm seeing we see interest in the running back room in the draft. I'm trying to find out where they're going to fit another running back on this team. There's interest in other wide receivers, like how many are they, they going to carry here? Uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff going on because this is a deep roster there's a lot of young talent and there could be log jams here coming up at position so i'm all for it uh i love it again it's small tweaks that make a really big difference and now you can have a little bit more flexibility in that running yeah. back position you don't have to do anything like uh crazy but i would also maybe pump our own brakes a little bit that not 
put it out of uh, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean to bring back one of these guys that were like, okay, now we got Sheffield. We're all set. We don't need those roles. And they still bring somebody back through sure. camp and just drive us nuts. Yeah. Now I, through camp, I'm okay with yeah. like if, if Jake Kumro gets a camp invite, if Taiwan Jones gets a camp invite, Kumro's for sure going to the Jets, right? Like, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? he's got it right. Like, yeah. Like it's like literally mandated as soon as they pulled the trade off. If he's got all this say that Randall Cobb that and has, yeah. Yeah, that would seem pretty pretty logical at, at that point. Um, so along those same lines, I know both of us were excited about this next move, but then maybe a little surprised at people's reaction to it. What was your thoughts when the Bills signed a uh, 5'11", 215-pound, you know, solid power back from the New England Patriots, Damian Harris? Yeah, this one, I haven't gotten to talk a lot about this because I, in the moment, I love it, right? Yep. Like Same, same. Because... I think it's a perfect fit. Yeah, it's a great fit for how I'm trying to build out this running back room pre-draft going into the draft where I'm, I'm really high on James Cook. I'm, I feel like I found out that I'm higher on Naheem Hines than a lot of the fan base is as well here in this last week because my going into this offseason was all about unlocking those guys and that potential in the offense. And it really goes in line with what my biggest uh, takeaway for this offseason from the Bills, what I want to see them improve on the most is – utilization of players i want to see them you have these two dynamic backs that i think are modern nfl backs you should be able to find ways to get those guys the ball so i want to see them be the primary touches type guys but naheem hines or uh damian harris fits what they don't do and when you can get some of that short yarded stuff the goal line stuff's there uh finishing off a team in a four minute offense some cold weather games i know people hate that cliche but that's true january football stuff like that they don't have that guy that can take on a pounding or has proven that he can kind of get into some of that short yardage stuff so bringing this in was a perfect fit to round out that room now i felt like you had a really good room going into almost any game day that you really had situational football so no matter how that game was going within the game, you had a running back to sort of fill that need uh, and put the defense in stress. So uh, that's what made me like it. Not so much the individual player. He's fun and he's had some really cool moments, unfortunately, against the Bills. Um, it it is a fun player. But I think people went too far and like, and maybe he, he will surprise me, but people went too far and like, no, guys, this is running back one. Like that, Like this is a guy that they're bringing in to take all those touches. I hope that's not the case. I don't think that is. So being able to kind of look at all the different pieces of, you know, the, the moves that are there, if someone sees this as a new, like primary, you know, bell cow back, it's not. Now, Damian Harris does have a thousand yard season, a 15 touchdown season. Like he's of good running back and has had opportunities where he got a lot of carries Mm -hmm. and was productive with them. I don't think in a weird offense too. Correct. Right. Correct. I don't think anyone expects that or sees that. And then that was reinforced with the contract. Again, um, we'll talk about that in a minute here. We saw 1.7 million for Trent Sherfield. It was 1.7 million for Damian Harris. They didn't pay him $1.7 million to come and be the franchise running back. Like he's actually the least paid running back in the room. Um, So, you know, I, I liked it a lot as the fit because I had been asking for a, you know, I had been asking for having that bigger power back because like you said, we like Singletary. We wanted somebody to fit that role. So I was happy about the fit, but then seeing people thinking that he's taking over like the one, a running back role. I don't see that. Maybe it's possible. Maybe I don't see that, but maybe. And if that's our problem is we don't know which of the talented running backs to give the ball to awesome. That's a yeah. great problem to have. I hope that's what we deal with. Uh, so I know this is your show, but I'm going to ask you a question if that's right. okay. We on spaces today, we were having this kind of conversation and it was really brought up around um, some of the rumors, the uh, Tajay sharp, where the bills had lunch with him, worked him out privately, worked with his, uh, the running back coach. Uh, we've seen it with Bijan Robinson and the other running back from Texas. So we're perceiving it as legitimate interest in running back room in the draft. They wouldn't go through all that. That's a lot of, assets to spend uh to look into a player if you're not actually interested in that position so we're assuming but so as to say you draft a running back i was kind of thinking looking at that damian harris i thought that he isn't as sure of a thing as people think right like that's expendable if you go some there but till was saying naheem hines makes more sense after the restructure where where would you be if you're bringing in 
a top three round running back uh, to this team? Um, so I am going to say, as weird as it sounds, I, I almost off. I almost think the two contracts in the way they've done them has closed the door on it. Um, so I mean, why are they they having meetings with the chart? Sure, that's not sure. smoke, right? Um, no, but I also don't. I never thought Sharp was a day two guy. Maybe they just like like every list I've seen has him as a day three. Well, guy. that's not, yeah, sure. Um, so like at that point, like yeah, you know, every day three guy is like, hey, let's see how it works, and maybe we'll get you on the practice squad. And so I, they could genuinely have interest in him. Sure. So let, let me go through the financial piece of it. I mean, they could eat two million dollars and cut Naheem Hines, I guess. Like they guaranteed him most of the money. So two million dollars isn't the end of the world. They could. Yeah. The same thing. Damien Harris is basically all of his money is guaranteed. They would pay him like yeah, one like... one point seven million dollars whether he played or not. Sure. Um. Again, not the end of the world. Yeah. Um. So you can, you know, kind of approach that as an option when it comes up. And don't get me wrong. If if Bijan Robinson falls to them at twenty seven and he's just standing out glaringly as the best available guy. Well, then you deal with it. You you draft him, and then, yep, you ha- have to – We could start a to go and fund me to eat get some the $2 million. Yeah, like it's – If some I, – I don't honestly – maybe I, – I, I haven't done any work on running backs because I don't expect it to be a thing. No. You know, is that Jameer Gibbs, is he thought of that highly, that if he made it to the second round, is that like something you can't possibly turn down? Um. I don't know. I don't think there's somebody besides B. John Robinson that is like absolutely, oh my God, you can't pass him up. This is just something you have to do. Anyone else be on yeah. there? I, I'm telling you, I, I'm pretty sure I could find a receiver, a middle linebacker, a defensive tackle, an offensive tackle that would just make more sense at any of those picks. And then I felt that way last year too. Though, Andre, don't at the draft, crazy. every single pick, okay. right, I was sitting next to you. <laughs> I was like, "No, this is definitely going to be I, interior this, offensive line for sure. It's going to be this guy." And then, like, uh, all right, we're going to go live right now, and I have no idea why they made this pick. Um, I heck, I'm I'm still harboring resentment that they made me almost swear in front of my mom with yeah. the the Creed Humphrey miss and, and taking uh, Boogie Basham. Um, so yes, of course they could do something here <laughs> financially. Our running back room is already paid. Like yeah. we have paid for these three. It is at a cap number that is exactly what I like. Like I'm very happy about the cap number. The fact that Modest those three allocation. guys combined, yeah. we have under a $6 million running back room. All three guys, it's like 5 million and change. That's what a modern running back room should be. All three guys can contribute. All three guys can be game day active because we have some special teams contributors and some other different places. So Going along those lines, um, yeah, producer Lauren. Aaron comes on, and producer Lauren, the first show she's missed all since we started the show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so you know, I and then on day three, day three picks don't matter, day three picks have no um impact on rosters, like. If you hit on someone and you find a Tyler Bass, a DeMar Hamlin, a Christian Benford, it's awesome. It's gravy. Yeah. It's fantastic. It gives you the luxury of choosing something else. At no point are they like structuring things because, hey, man, we took Tajay Spears in the fifth round and now we got to figure it out. If he's awesome, like, great. That would be wonderful if we got to figure out how to trade Naheem Hines or Damian Harris before, you know, the, the cut down and, and things like that. But I, I don't, I do think it shows that they have other plans for those day one, day two picks outside of there. Uh, it's for me right now, it's all in for Jack, yeah. right? Trade back for yeah. Jack. Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, right Start now, shirt, get some shirts and stickers. Yeah. Even though I want an offensive tackle more than that. And for, we won't go down that path too far tonight because we'll have lots of shows coming up with, uh, you know, our mock draft, you know, projections and fun things like that. Um, So I won't go too far down that path, but I would rather an offensive tackle, but right now, I, for as little as I trust Spencer Brown, I trust him more than I do Terrell Bernard and Terrell Dotson. So we need a middle linebacker more than, even and I, though I, I value a more, tackle more than a middle linebacker. I feel like there's more tackles in the draft than there are mm-hmm. linebackers. That's my where guys I who can come in and play yeah. right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So anyways, that's a different topic. Anywho. Um, so then a couple other things. Uh, we brought back speaking of needing a tackle, we brought back David Questenberry. Um floors, floors are fine. You gotta yes, him. You know, I, I, he's one of those guys where you know he's he is good enough to be on an NFL roster. Mm-hmm. He deserves to be a depth tackle in this league. He's that guy that we talk about. Um, hey, you know, it can't get any worse. You know, it can. There are guys that are worse than David Questenberry that you don't want in there. Um, I also don't really want David Questenberry playing. <laughs> you know, I don't want him to have to go into a game. I'm cool if it's him or Bobby Hart for that sixth offensive line role. Uh, I would love a world where Spencer Brown is the swing tackle and that sixth offensive lineman. That would be awesome if yeah. Darnell Wright was our starting right tackle and, and Spencer Brown was that guy. But David Questenberry is a guy. Do you think David Edwards, uh, guard that signed from the Rams, guy that has Aaron Cromer connections, guys that we, you know, heard some things about the reasons they may like him, mm-hmm. do you think he's just a guy or do you think he could push people in camp a little more than what Questenberry might be able to? Uh, I do think that there's a little bit of interesting depth right now in the interior, uh, uh along the offensive line uh, a little bit here. And I th- do think there are some guys that can push people. I, they're not names that we were thinking of. They're not the guys that were on our free agency yeah. wish list for you and I, Greg, but, um, let's remember i think it's incremental uh progress right now obviously it's going to be a benefit over roger saffold i think any warm body at this point was going to be sadly uh, he was you know an upgrade we were hoping we had the one more dance because he he would you know it's not like roger saffold was always a below average bad guard it's just unfortunately we got him the you know year too late year too late instead of year too early and we found out the hard way yeah, for sure. But now I think you're going in a different direction where they're taking guys that seem to be ascending players at these positions. And right now I think they 25, are 26 years old, 25, 26 years old. And I think they're right now at uh, adequate starter level, average starter level, which is totally yeah. fine. That's a better. You're uh, already raised your floor uh, for Roger Saffold a year ago there. I think Bacher is uh, right there. Like last we saw him before the Achilles injury, Ike Bacher was kind of in that, hey, this could be a somewhat below average to average rotational interior offensive lineman here. What's he saying? Edwards, a three year starter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good with starts under here. his belt. Yeah. At a minimum. So I don't, how about this? I am certain the first day of training camp, the interior of the Bills offensive line is Connor McGovern. Mitch Morris, Rick Bates. Like those are going yeah. to be the three guys the first day of training camp. I also expect them to be the three guys the opening game of the season. But having a guy like David Edwards, who has, I think, 45 starts the last three years, including in the Rams Super Bowl run, he started all 17 regular season games mm-hmm. and all three or all four playoff games for all 21 games yeah. of their Super Bowl season. Yeah. He started every single game. That's a pretty good, that's a really nice luxury as a backup. Now you have backups uh, at, at that level. And then again, I'm saying Ike Bakker is right there. R- probably a good backup in the NFL. I, I would challenge anyone to go through the entire NFL offensive lines and look at right tackle situations. One, starting right tackle situations around the league aren't fantastic. And then you start looking at the depth of, of guys behind starters. It's very thin at big humans that are good at blocking in the NFL. It's not a deep pool throughout the entire league. And so just getting guys that can come in that have some starting experience that can be not a huge drop off. You know, you just don't want guys that are be- way below average right. to like journeymen it's type a, guys. And that are on the wrong side of an ascending yeah. or, or, or on the descending side of their careers. Yeah. A lot of really smart football people use this analogy. The offensive line is more about how high your weakest link yeah. is than how good your biggest stud is. Like having a Trent Williams or like just this a Zach Martin or a Quentin Nelson is great, but if you have a weak link on the offensive line, defensive coaches are too smart not to scheme their best guy against your worst guy. So yeah. raising the tide of how good your worst guy is is actually m- more important than having mm-hmm. a stud on the offensive yeah. line. Even though studs are great, I would love to have a Quentin Nelson. Of course, I would love to have that. But having just raising the tide of where that is. Um, and I know just from the financial side, I know Fred uh, is always real active. Um, I, a handful of people have asked this. I'm going to just let everybody know. So, you know, we 
Cover One is not a news-breaking organization. We have people tell us stuff all the time. We had some people tell us that this David Edwards thing was happening, um, and everything they said checked out exactly, including before the news broke on the Trent Sherfield and the Damian Harris contracts, before those numbers were out, the person who told me David Edwards was signing told me he signed for $1.77 million. Since Trent Sherfield and Damian, Damian Harris came out, both of those contracts are exactly $1.77 million. I'm going to trust that David Edwards signed for $1.77 million. We'll see if that changes. I'll, I'll take this back. I'm going to trust that that person who told me the other things that that was so accurate. We signed Connor McGovern for $7 million. So I, I am going to follow the money. I am going to assume Connor McGovern was very clearly signed to be the starter and David Edwards was very clearly signed to be quality depth. I'm sure they committed to him that you can come in and compete. And if you win the job, the best guy gets the job. Cause of course that's true. But again, day one and the expectation for week one is Connor McGovern, Mitch Morris, Ryan Bates, left guard, center, right guard. Yeah. And I, I just love um, the fact that you are in a position Again, I know I agree with you that like with Questenberry, you don't want Questenberry to play, right? But I, it, it could be what much worse. And you have guys that have legitimate starting experience that have played at an adequate level. You can get by there. We're gonna have to play these guys at some point. But I, Questenberry and uh, Edwards are both gonna get playing time in this season, or Bacher is gonna get playing time this season. You're gonna have an offensive lineman go down. You're gonna have guys come in uh, and rotate in and out. And so this is a good move. It's not getting talked about enough in, in the protect Josh Allen scheme of things, but I, I still want more if that I I'm Look all at the about Eagles if, last year when they could just yeah. bring in Andre Dillard and had a first round pick sitting yes. there as a guy that could come in that was, you know, not a great pick as a first round pick right. left tackle by having a guy who could come in and play guard that hey like you said really high floor yeah that and that's exactly how i feel on it right now so um so those were all the signings that were there we're going to do one more little exercise here uh to talk about it but all the folks that are listening right now again this is a brand new show you can see the wonderful graphics that my man aaron helped helped us create we're trying to get things started for this new show the best way you can help is to press that like button it really goes a long ways Please help me out. Press the like button, share, rate, review. Um, I'm going to continue to look at the reviews that people are leaving and read some of the best ones on here. If you can make me laugh um, with the reviews, we've had some really funny ones. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll share some more of those as they come up. Um, but really, really help us a lot. That would go a long ways to be able to do it. Um, one more piece before, and again, the, we'll spend probably the rest of our time rambling about DeAndre Hopkins here. Um, some news broke today that uh, does look to be legitimate here that uh, Calais Campbell is coming to Buffalo for a visit. Um, I know you've made some comments that have kind of registered with me that it seems like we're not seeing as many in-person physical visits anymore. And when those are happening, they seem to be not like a done deal, but pretty legitimate interest and like a very high probability. What were your thoughts? Um, 38 years old. I won't lie. I, I haven't done work on Calais Campbell, but somebody right. who I trust has, and that's Cole Jackson. Someone yep. we've had on our show multiple times knows the Ravens inside and out. Um, he said he absolutely still has stuff left in the tank would be kind of the pairing behind Daquan Jones as having another big, powerful guy mm -hmm. that can be stout, keep linebackers clean, great against the run, can take up double teams and let the other guys pass rush. Um, and is, you know, and former, still can penetrate. Yeah. Yes. And also one former NFL man of the year, mm -hmm. one of like legitimately the most respected uh, people in the NFL yeah. and is six, eight with monster arms and bats down passes. Like he's never stopped doing that every year five, six, seven, eight, knock batted down passes. Um, I, I'm not like excited because it's not somebody who's going to come in and have like a 10 sack season. Like he's going to come in and the, the box score is never going to do it. But if we were to sign Calais Campbell, where would it register for you on David Questenberry versus Damian Harris scale? Uh, this would be a fun one for me because I do think, uh, one, I, defensive tackle is a huge need for 2024 and beyond uh, for me. This wouldn't be a beyond move, but one, 
this would be a stand move for me. Clay Campbell is one of my favorite players along the defensive line right now in football has been for the last decade. I just love everything about him. The size, the get off the ball, like, and he still flashes some of that. I keep an eye. This is a player I do keep an eye on. He still had six sacks last year, Greg. Uh, like oh, the, for this real? guy's, I didn't yeah, even look. Six, yeah, this guy's okay. S- he's still okay. got some push. He's got something left in the tank. I don't know how much, uh, but you don't need a lot. I think you still have a decent enough rotation. Size here. age as well. Yeah, size age as well. Um, and yeah, you're just looking for some penetration there in that one tech role and spell oh, Daquan. Some gargoyle. Some people I, I I call him Cookie Monster. He sounds like Cookie he, Monster. Yeah, a little Cookie Monster. Yeah. Uh, Sarah here, who I, I saw down at the senior bowl. It's good to see her down there uh checking out different players. Uh yeah. actually went to school at the same time, University of Miami. Uh Jay Frank brings up a good one here, potential kind of mentor for mm-hmm. Gregory Rousseau, former University of Miami guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, really tall, lanky guy. You, you learn how to use that length. Another good voice in that room. I, Sean McDermott's I not going to be mad at yeah. it. Correct. I right. wouldn't... It, this is not like a... We'll talk about moving the needle kind of move with, with one coming up here. This is not a move that people are going to look back like, oh man, that was like the key trigger. But this yeah. is a guy who can come in and contribute. And again, if you take... Isaiah McKenzie up to Deontay Hardy and Jay Kumaro up to Trent Shurfield and Devin Singletary for the role up to Damian Harris. Mm -hmm. And our backup guards are now David Edwards and Ike Bakker. And you take a chance that now that rotational fourth guy is now a Calais Campbell where we didn't even have an actual one tech behind Daquan Jones last year. It's just Let's one more little thing. One more little out, thing. Uh, swap out Shaq Lawson for Justin Houston, and let's, oh. let's go prosper. Let's right? Go. You want to prosper? I, I enjoy prospering. Yeah. All right. So now the fun one. I know you did an awesome uh, spaces on it earlier. We've been talking about it all week. The rumor of DeAndre Hopkins mm. being traded to the Buffalo Bills. Um, you know, we can tell you with you know, a a very reasonable degree of confidence. There are far, far too many plugged in legitimate people talking about this. And I know some people have brought up, Oh, but nothing ever leaks out of, Mm -hmm. you know, one bill's drive. That's accurate. I don't think any of this is leaking out of one bill's drive, but when you're talking about a player who is openly on the market in Arizona or yeah. like it's openly talked about it's been reported that DeAndre Hopkins is willing to work on his contract to get a trade done mm-hmm. that means every possible trade even though he, he used to have a no trade clause the Cardinals now have to go to him to make sure hey are you going to be cool redoing your deal for right. this team they have to check with him still like he still has kind of a pseudo no trade clause that's a lot of potential mouths in the telephone game, that's where the leaks are coming from. So people like Ben Albright, people like Michael Florio, like too many people who are plugged into things are saying that, Hey, the leader here, um, Daniel Jeremiah, multiple people, yeah. a Pac-Man Jones, to, who honestly, I think Pac-Man to me out of this whole thing, this sounds weird to me. And I feel <laughs> crazy even saying this, Greg, <laughs> I feel like Pac-Man Joe, the second I heard him on McAfee, I was like this, now it was real for me because I get, I'm, 90 percent sure that his source is deandre hopkins the, you, like the way he was talking about correct. it the way it felt to me i might be wrong on it i'm happy to be wrong if i am but dude he knew something he was talking correct. to his boy and got some information yes. and to me that was the only thing i needed to hear that this is very real and now it's just that and it could be it doesn't mean that it's going to happen you know as well as anyone trades could get messy this Absolutely. could just fall sideways it's a negotiation but the interest uh at least from the, i think the bill side and hopkins side is real and that's what i took from pac-man and pac-man the most legitimate uh source in sports right now yeah, who would have thought it, yeah who who would have <laughs> thought of it uh you remember at the draft we saw pac-man we jones saw we see yeah aaron and i saw pac-man jones and we were down in vegas for the draft so yeah. uh yeah, we, i think he told us uh bills needed to draft a corner fast they corner, did he said, <laughs> they and did, they did it so and he was Pac-Man. right then too yeah. um so i know a handful of people here in the chat saying that the peds ended yeah you're right the um so deandre hopkins does not officially have a no trade clause what I was saying was the fact that any team that acquires him needs him to redo his deal. They'd still kind of need his permission. So um, what that's saying is if he doesn't want to go to Atlanta or Chicago or, you know, a team like that, he can just say, eh, I'm not going to rework my deal for them. And they okay. would have to just fit him in with no help. Right. So it doesn't mean that he, he can, can literally say no, 
But if he's interested in going to a team, he can work with them and make it a lot easier. So he still has some input and leverage on that. And no team wants to give anything um, to, you know, away for a player that doesn't want to be there. So right. um, a, a couple of things the some people have asked about the money. So um, the Bills right now, I have them at $9 million in cap space. So they had 9.8. I am projecting the exact number that was told to me, which was uh, David Edwards signing for 1.77 million. Our lowest guy on the salary cap would then bump down, and that's about 900,000. So I'm going to use that $800,000 difference as the 9.8 down to 9 million. So $9 million, when you're talking about the our draft class, is going to take like $2.5 million. And being like so, that is buffer. You want your correct. buffer, right? So 2.5, he needs, you know, last year we had so many guys that got called up and got bumped down to IR and then got called up from the practice squad. Each of those guys, when they get called up, you have to pay them a minimum salary for that one week that you have to be able to pull them over. So it really does take like three, three and a half million dollars just to survive through a season of normal transactions. That's without a trade deadline trade that's without some big signing in season that's just a function as a franchise so two and a half and three and a half that's six million so three million dollars in cap space is not enough for anything and that's you know we haven't signed a linebacker we haven't signed a pass rusher we haven't done anything so there's a couple things they can play with the options that they have that are most realistic are going to be you know obviously we talked before if they want to trade at oliver that is a huge Mm -hmm. trigger that they could pull Um, trading at Oliver would create $10 million, $10.7 million. He's his fifth year option is fully guaranteed, but it would send that with, and real quick here, Eric, uh, Klischke adding the bills have 9.8. The uh, chiefs only have seven. It's yeah. just six, six and change. So they have less than we do. They would have the same problems we would. And they actually have already used most of their big triggers. And the ones I'm going to talk about, the trigger, bills, they already use Mahomes trigger. They cannot it, right? use any more. Yeah. Um, they've already used some of their big ones. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, yeah, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a real shame. Um, so <laughs> at Oliver getting traded um, would create a hole. We would then need to fill a starting three tech. That's not a good situation to be in, but financially, he makes sense. If you had somebody yeah. to pay something of value, um, Could I you would just line up two big humans and not uh, uh, three tech. I would be open to it. And some uh, small I'd, linebackers. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, keep linebackers clean with some large humans in front of them. I'd, I'd be open to it. Um, so that that right there is in play. We'll see. That takes two parties. That's nothing the Bills can do on their own. You need a team. They're not going to give away at Oliver. They're not going to trade him for a sixth round pick. I just don't think that's the case. They would need something. I'd want more than a fourth round pick. Maybe that's my cutoff that if you got a fourth round pick, maybe that's enough. I'd want a third uh, to be able to do it. A late third is fine. Um, oh, God, if they if they traded him, use that money to make this DeAndre Hopkins trade and sign Puna Ford, I I would say inappropriately. Excited. Insufferable, I feel like. Is I would be what you would be. I, yeah. I would be so. Yeah, I would. It would be bad. It would be yeah. Bad. People would get very tired of me. Um, yeah. oh, more tired than they already are. Um, so let's assume that's not the case because the build that takes two to tango. They can't just make somebody trade right. for Ed Oliver. So the couple of things that are in play now are uh, two restructures that they could do. They have not restructured Tredavious White. They have not restructured Deion Dawkins. Trey White is 5.88 million. Deion Dawkins is 6.39 million. So those two together, you're talking about $12.4 million. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a pretty healthy number. It's a, a very functional, reasonable way to approach it. More than enough money. The challenge is, and this is an important part. I actually talked to some of the uh, my other salary cap uh, people that are experts on different teams, um, especially uh, my guy down in Houston that, that does a, a Texans cap. He's awesome on Twitter. One of the best followers you guys can have for that. Um, so we talked with Joel Corey. The challenge for the Bills is you have to have enough room to trade for him under his current contract and then restructure him because the restructure is the bills paying him the bonus. So to pay the bonus, you have to already have him in the house and then pay him. So for one brief moment in time, the bills would have to have $19 million in cap space for that one brief moment to fit him 
then they could do their restructure. You can shrink DeAndre Hopkins without getting him in no, um, no, uh, you know, pay cut or anything for Hopkins. You can restructure it with giving him the full 19 million down to 4.8 million. So we can then fit him easily and get that space back. For th- but for the moment, you'd have to create that. The one cheat code around there is what Houston did with Brandon Cooks. If Arizona was willing to pay before he got traded, um, Air- Houston took Brandon Cooks' $18 million salary, paid $6 million of it. The Cowboys took in twelve. They only had to have room for the 12, and then they restructured the 12 to bring it down lower. So that's been thrown out there a lot. I know Bill Barnwell from ESPN put that out there, that he thinks the Cardinals are going to have to eat like $10 million of it to get anything of value. And there is there's a direct um, correlation in the draft compensation right. <clears throat> versus what the Cardinals eat. So for every dollar they eat, they get a little bit better draft pick. It's a carrot. And, Here's a carrot. Take you know, more. <laughs> so, and, and I honestly, I'm kind of ambivalent to that. Like, as long as it works that way, like find the balance that works. Yeah. So uh, if, if they want us to eat all 19 million, that's fine. I'm going to give you like a sixth round pick. And if you want to eat some money and we get a cheap DeAndre Hopkins, more picks. you want to know what? <laughs> if you tell me that I get DeAndre Hopkins for like $5 million and it costs yeah. me a third round pick, I won't be happy that we gave up a third round pick, but it's DeAndre Hopkins. Good yeah. Lord. And we're getting another third round pick. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Can't pay. Well, that's next, that's year, and yeah. next year. Well, yeah, but still, you're, they're picks. It's coming. Like, it's coming. Yeah. You're, I'm not worried about that. You, you're not going to find uh, a talent like DeAndre Hopkins. One, we Bean can't draft. He's not drafting at DeAndre Hopkins anyway. But you're not going to get that level of talent in 2024 Correct. anywhere in this draft. Correct. Yeah. Correct. No, I mean there are guys. I love Jackson Smith and Jigba. There's and some long term guys awesome. that could be yes, awesome. Yes. Uh, like assuming that any of those guys are going to be better than DeAndre Hopkins in this 2023 this, this season and in the 2024 Super Bowl, they're not. <laughs> He's yeah. going to be better than those guys right now. He is still phenomenal right now to do that. Um, and you know, Ron saying that we could offer future picks. I actually think Arizona may be interested in that. They're, they know yeah. they're in a rebuild. It is um, a actually, period there. The deal that I brought up was with two picks a, a later pick this year and then a little bit better pick in 2024. So a fifth round pick in 2023. Because hey, that's what Brandon Cooks went for. That's what Stefan Gilmore went for. I think Hopkins is a little bit better than those two players in their current mm-hmm. standing. Um, and then next year. I'll give you a conditional pick that's based on three factors that would escalate it. Um, Him playing a set amount of games in 2023, the Bills making the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl, one of those two, and three, that he is on the roster five days into the 2024 year because none of his money is guaranteed. Right. So if it doesn't go well and they cut him, because hey, you know he just he never he couldn't come all the way back. Blew he out the knee again. or something. He blew out yeah. a knee, whatever. Actually, blown out of the knee probably would, like, it would need to be that he didn't play well. If it was injury, uh, it probably actually would guarantee his money the next year. I so mean, it would it would need to be. Wow. He just didn't live up to it and didn't play well. Um, that's not. But gonna either way, we could see. Yeah, I, yeah. Again, I don't think it's likely, but either way, those kind of conditions where if he's on the roster the fifth day into the league year and we're going to have him for two full years. And the next year is it's $14 million, which isn't cheap, but that like, that's still pretty good pay. We just saw that's like Juju Smith Schuster and uh, you know, uh, who's the Patriots guy who signed uh, Jacoby Myers, Jacoby Myers. Like that's yeah. their kind of money. Like, all right, we'll, we'll live with that. Yeah. Um, So I would give that. And like each of those things, if we check each of those boxes, it goes from, you know, a fifth to a fourth to a third. If we make it to the Super Bowl and he plays 14 plus games and he's on the roster in 2024, I'll give you a third round pick too. Like, Honestly, I'll just throw in an extra future just like as a gratuity. If that, if all that <laughs> just, works out, thanks, like picking the dealer. <laughs> yeah, at that we, point. we appreciate you, brother. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that again. Oh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, and now, you know, we, he had come up a fair amount with, some of the rumors, you know, he's been out there when this came out there. And I, sure. I had just assumed that there's no way we would could afford to get involved. And I, I won't lie. 
this was my same reaction when I heard about the contract for Von Miller. I was like, I, I don't know how that's possible. I don't know how we're going to do it. It makes no sense. I can't do the math. I'm not far off of here, you know, because then I saw they made Von Miller six year, $120 million deal, and he was a $5 million cap hit. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, I guess we could do whatever we want now. And <laughs> no, math isn't real anymore. And seeing so, the Brandon Cook's move happen correct. and the way that that was correct. structured also is like, okay, like there's ways to make some of this stuff just disappear and to change the way that it looks uh, and move that money around. So there, there are ways for it to happen. This one for me, Greg, early on when the, um, it makes sense that people would say, this is a player that's going to be on the way out. He's going to be a trade candidate. When it first started coming up, I didn't really take it at all that seriously because one, I I've said it a bunch of times on our show. I've said it all over it, wherever I can, that I want separators for Josh Allen speed yeah. guys. I can separate. Yeah. I've got stuff on digs. The number one guy I'm happy with the room, but I would just want guys that separate. I think they brought that in here in free agency in a small way in wide receivers, four or five. I think Khalil Shakir is going to end up being that kind of guy. Yep. Um, yep. You already got that in Stefan Diggs. DeAndre Hopkins isn't a big time separator, right? So he wasn't really on my radar there early on for that reason. I wanted more for Josh Allen, but now that you've kind of refined this room a little bit and gotten a little bit better in those areas, I believe now it makes a little bit more sense for me and with what's available, right? Like I was in on the idea of bringing in an OBJ type of guy. Uh, I believe DeAndre Hopkins is better than that right now. Like it's a more versatile, better producing player that has less injury history that you could roll with. Uh, so that would be an upgrade for me. The only thing that I would do over this move right now that isn't really even necessarily available because the compensation Denver is looking for would be a Jerry Judy yeah. move is the only thing that I would want over DeAndre Hopkins. But I had said it on one of the spaces that it would seem like a weird fit to me in terms of stylistically what I want for Josh Allen is guys that could separate, get open, get some yards after catch. Cause I don't see Josh Allen throw a ton of the 50, 50. Sometimes you have to throw to Deandre right. Hopkins when he doesn't appear to be open. He's always open, right? He's that guy that can go up and get it. Josh Allen is going to have to earn that trust and do that. I'm okay with trying to figure that out. I still think it will be good. They'll get some good production, but people really came at me. Like I was like, I don't know. Like, it, it, there's some unknown there and how he fits and how they're going to get to where he's still a great player. He'll have great production. People are like, dude, you're an idiot. Like Josh Allen can throw to anyone. And it's like, okay, but I'm just saying like, there's other fits that uh, if they were to become available, I would, the stylistic uh, comp of them is more intriguing than Hopkins, but he's still one of the, like yeah. being able to get in on a player like that is you got to do it. Yeah, absolutely. He's too talented. And yeah. a lot of guys in the chat throwing out some good examples here. Um, Ron talking about, again, the Houston deal is the blueprint for this. Um, yeah. Jeffrey here, here saying, you know, if, if Arizona pays most of it, this is – so I wouldn't do this one, but it, it does bring up a good question. Jeffrey saying, would you trade this year's first for their second and Hopkins? That's too far for me. But I will say the Elijah Moore deal is interesting. So Elijah Moore went um, – Elijah Moore and a third – went from the Jets to Cleveland for their second. So right. if you told me we needed to trade down from the second into the third and have two third round picks for DeAndre Hopkins now and with that Arizona eating a ton of the money to get another second round pick and we would get two third round picks and DeAndre Hopkins, I'd listen. Like I, I don't know if I'd say yes, but that at least that's not an immediate no for me. That's uh um they would need to eat a lot, it's, but I'd listen. And it seems more the problem with this right now is it seems like there's le obviously a legitimate interest from Hop, a plane in Buffalo. Buffalo is in on this, but from yes. the other reports of other teams being out because they're unwilling to eat anything is not that's not reasonable. Like if they're going to move, it's also this, not gonna... shocking because Arizona's owner B Bruce Bidwell is his or uh, what's B Bidwell's first name? Oh, no. Whatever the He's hell being a, isn't he going to be arrested or something? Is yeah, that maybe it? like it's the historically or... famously cheap. I think their I think their GM was the one that that was right. Yeah, uh, set aside allegedly, uh, allegedly, allegedly. allegedly. Yes. Uh, but Bidwell is famously cheap, so it's not shocking yeah. that he wants a good pick and doesn't want to eat any money. And yes. now they got ruined by seeing the Brandon Cooks deal ruined everything for them. Yeah, because you know Cooks is younger and healthier, and of course, um, you know they would. They would be able to, you know, get something good back for him, but it's 
Bill Bidwell. Thank you. Good Lord. Um, the chat helping me out there. Um, so you're just a famously cheap guy. And of course they would want a really good pick and not eat any of the money. That's where I would start too. every sure. negotiation starts with your perfect scenario. Then the cooks deal just cut their legs out. Now he's still kind of clamoring for that. And I would guess his cheapness would lean more towards, all right, fine, we'll take the crappy draft pick, but you got to pay the money. And if that's the case, yeah. and we have to, you know, pull all the levers on our side and restructure Trey and Dawkins, which would, would those two would take us from 9 million to 21.8 million. Yeah. We would absorb DeAndre Hopkins at 19.45 million. We would immediately restructure him down to 4.8 million. And then poof, we'd have $15 million in cap space again. And yeah. we'd function as a franchise and we'd keep rolling right along and we'd do everything we needed to. So it is absolutely, if the Arizona Cardinals eat $0, it is still possible for the Bills to trade for DeAndre Hopkins. It's just now that brings the leverage of them saying, okay, if you guys don't want to eat any of the money, we're not going to give you much. You know, it'll be like the Brandon Cooks deal. Like, hey, you're right. Brandon Cooks plus them paying $6 million is the same as DeAndre Hopkins. That means the going rate is a fifth and a sixth. Yeah. That's just how this works. Yeah, and but we've seen the interest heat up. We've seen the source and stuff heat up. Been on D Hop Watch for seven seventy plus hours <laughs> yeah. now, right? Yeah. Like, like I don't know how long before, I'm doing. Go before I go to bed, I'm refreshing. I'm waking up and rolling over and refreshing. Yeah, it could pop at any time, but this could yeah. this could go a couple weeks if they're at a part in the negotiation. Like you're talking this, if they're saying we're not eating anything, they're still at the beginning of the negotiation, right? Like, so this could be something that takes a little bit of time if the holdups on there and, and there Hopkins, there's not a rush right now to yeah. get it done anyway. And if Hopkins is telling them that he wants to go there and that there it's hard for the other, if, um, so like I said, the bills can barely make it work yeah. barely, but they can. I, I actually talked to a couple chiefs people. If the card, the only way the chiefs can trade for him is if the Cardinals eat money. Yeah, they cannot absorb his contract under any circumstances without having the that piece of it. So um, Sarah and a couple other folks in the chat here talking about there are some options. I only talked about the restructure, so I can talk about those real quick. There are two primary ones. One, mm -hmm. uh, Daquan Jones, which I've been an advocate of for a while yep. here. Uh, we just talked about how Calais Campbell size ages well. I'm comfortable. I know not everyone is comfortable with extending mm -hmm. Daquan Jones. Some people want to see an extra year uh, of of him playing well. I'm comfortable extending I'm cool him right it. now. Yeah. And doing so can clear $4.8 million. That could be instead of one of the restructures, we'd still have to do another one. Yeah. Um, we just brought back Jordan Poyer on a two-year deal. So Let's I'll give Mike a high one more Mike. year. Like, yeah, I'm Mike cool now. with that. Why Why do we have this offsetting thing? Just let them ride off into the sunset together. Yes. Um, I'm cool giving Mike a high one more year and pairing him up with Jordan Poyer. That's another one that could clear $4.3 So, now, weirdly, ex extending those two would get us, I think... Nine million and change. Mm -hmm. Nine million in our current cap number is like not. It would get us to like eighteen point something. Just we right on the like it actually wouldn't be enough to get. We'd have to do one other thing. Yeah. Um, so I know some people talked about Taron Johnson, who he's more of a Milano setup. Like he's not due both Micah Hyde and Dean. I was gonna uh, say he just got an extension. Daquan Jones, right, it was just last year. Yeah, uh, but it was short. It wasn't a long right. one. So right. he's got this year and one more left. So did Milano. Milano had this year and one more left. You could do that. That's not normal, but hey, they did Josh two years early. They did Diggs two years early. They We're just all did Milano two too. years early. We're into uncharted territory. That's now a possibility. Um, so Daquan Jones and Micah Hyde are the two that make the most sense for me extension wise. Taron Johnson would be next on the list. Other guys, you know, of course we can extend Tyler Bass and Gabe Davis or other people like that. Yeah. You wouldn't do that in this scenario because they don't save you money. But that brings up right. a question for me. Gabe Davis is going into the final year of his contract. Yes, he is. If they trade for DeAndre Hopkins what would you say if their request was we'll do it and eat the money, but we want Gabe Davis back? I'm torn. Cause there's the idea in my brain. Uh, I didn't 
really think about trading him in this scenario because I don't know that they want to take on. I don't think they want Gabe Davis uh, in this deal necessarily. I think they just want the picks or if somebody to eat up some of this. He's money. only one cheap year. He's two million and change for this year. He's only sure. one cheap year. It would be because they see him as a part of their future and want to extend him. Um, so I don't let, know what that coach take is that yeah, for sure. Take. Say yeah. What do you think it does to Gabe Davis and his future with the Bills? So what my vision of this is that it's actually a benefit to Gabe Davis. I think that you can move all these guys around. You can move Stephon Diggs into the slot. You can move Hopkins in the slot. Hopkins, Gabe and, Davis. Hopkins and Diggs both played pretty well in the slot. They have, and you could do it with Davis, and you could do some creative things. I know they want to have more 12 personnel. I'm not saying move Gabe Davis to tight end, but you could have him as a big slot moved in towards the line. He's so good at blocking, and yeah. you could have Hopkins and Diggs in with Dawson Knox. There's some creative stuff that you can but do here with that size. The 12 personnel, but Gabe Davis. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it gives you some of the creative things that you want to do. And I think that the gravity that those two pull and Hopkins and Diggs and what that's going to do to defensive coordinators will open up some stuff for him. And a, a good season for Gabe Davis would be a huge benefit for the Bills. And your favorite thing this time of year, some comp pick bingo going yep. into the future. If Gabe Davis has a big season, that could be another substantial yep. pick. You could have, uh, if Ed Oliver sticks around, they aren't able to move that deal, ain't, aren't able to do anything with him. We're, we better hope that he has a fantastic season too and goes off and gets a big contract because now you're talking real compact bingo yep. uh if gabe davis and ed oliver both pop we're stuck on it with that deal um th those are the scenarios that i want to see play out is gabe stays goes on a super bowl run he becomes uh the one guy in free agency next year that is sought after and he gets a very handsome contract to go somewhere else and the bills get sent to pick back that's where they're at i know people have wanted that compact stuff to pop over the last couple of years but because of the way they drafted and brought along people and re-signed their own guys now they're coming up against that where some of the guys are slipping through you're going to see in the next two three years them be more into these comp picks um but it's going to come from those players performing well on the last years here of their deals yeah, and I think, you know, Tremaine Edmonds is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. They weren't sure enough of giving him the monster deal before his fifth year. He has his best year of his career, gets all pro votes in his fifth year, goes out, signs an $18 million deal, gets the bag from the Bears. That's your ideal scenario here is, and, you know, Ed Oliver as well. You know, we've seen inconsistent flashes through the first four years. If he yep. has a Tremaine Edmonds type fifth year, perfect. That's a good for all scenario. parties involved. Good for all parties involved. <laughs> I'll take a third round pick and wish him all the best. Yeah. Um, Gabe Davis absolutely could see some really nice numbers as a consistent third option mm -hmm. in an offense where you have a, two, a really top heavy DeAndre Hopkins and Stefan Diggs both getting. You know, you're probably talking like damn near 300 targets for the two of them in an offense. So it would bring down the the volume number for Gabe Davis, mm -hmm. but he would be so wide open in some of those scenarios that if his efficiency numbers would look awesome. And then he would have the pitch that a Christian Kirk had going into free agency to say, hey, he's just hasn't had the opportunity. Let him come be your, you know, 1A, 1B kind of guy. And if he gets a... $18 million deal, all of a sudden that's a third round pick. And that's mm -hmm. what, you know, and that's what Christian Kirk got paid. That's what Mike Williams got paid. That's what some of these other, you know, next tier receivers get. He'd have the opportunity to do that. I would rather go that route yeah. and be able to, you know, be able to help that kind of, that kind of structure to, yeah. Uh, be able to go that direction. So one one point I want to make about this whole DeAndre Hopkins thing, I've I've seen rumblings of, and I want to just give my opinion on it while I have a platform here. Is I think some folks have taken the interest in DeAndre Hopkins as a um, that it's some type of slight towards Gabe Davis. I do not think they have anything to do with each other. I think the Buffalo Bills are very happy with Gabe Davis as number two wide receiver. There's an opportunity that presented itself to get better. Like DeAndre Hopkins is just better. This is the business of football. A better player became available. It doesn't mean that they're out on Gabe or they're want, they want they don't trust him as a number two receiver. So if this move doesn't happen, I don't think that it changes how in the Buffalo Bills are on the guys that they have in their locker room. This is just you have an opportunity to get a once in a lifetime opportunity to get a two all pro past all pro wide receivers together and line them up. You got to at least give it all you've got and try to find a way to make it work. But it's not an indictment of Gabe Davis, no. in my opinion. I I will I'll almost guarantee you 
if this were to happen, and there's no guarantee, it, you know, so I know some people have asked, like, we've talked about this. It is very real. The possibility is real. Their research is real. Them doing legitimate medical due diligence is real. That means it's way beyond the point of like, oh, hey, just a little whisper. No, this means it's real. This means now yeah. it's very logical that Arizona now is like, well, we want a little bit more than that. Let us go try to shop around and see who else we can get to bump up your offer. Um, all of that stuff means it could like literally I've refreshed Twitter like 10 times I've during the show tonight just to check. It could happen that fast. It also, just because it's that close, doesn't mean it can't fall apart. Like, it absolutely can fall apart. Those mm -hmm. things happen all the time. Um, yeah. We talked about it with Greg Olson. Greg Olson has talked about it in interviews afterwards that he was very, very close to signing with the Bills. Those rumors were real. It was his final two. He even said, yeah, honestly, I wish I had a bet on Josh Allen instead of Russell Wilson. It would have been really fun, a fun way to end my career. He picked Russell Wilson instead, but the it, what didn't mean the rumors weren't true. It meant right. he was very, very close. And yes, I ended up going the other direction. I didn't choose that. That's what this is. And like, in trades, is, you have less choice. Like correct. there's more the, hands not, involved. Yeah. Yes. So all those things don't mean that this might not still fall apart, but it yeah. doesn't mean it wasn't real. It doesn't yeah. mean that Brandon Bean wasn't legitimately all the way in on this and trying to make it happen. They're just now playing chicken with a new GM trying to make a splash in Arizona now probably being forced to trade his most talented player and trying not to look like an idiot in doing so. And it's just a staring match with a cheap owner versus a team and an owner willing to do whatever it takes and pay all these bonuses. And now it's just going to be a waiting game and them waiting. Probably it could drag out closer to the draft. It could, I hope it doesn't. It's not good for my heart. Um, but the idea that having a chance for a guy who was not in our plans to begin the season, this mm -hmm. just kind of fell in the Bills' lap to say, oh, wait, he's interested in coming here and yeah. we can make this work? Oh, yeah. uh, sure, let's figure this out. Like yeah. that, uh, Rex Ryan told us that the story about how the Kiko Alonzo, LaShawn McCoy traded. Like somebody called and they're like, wait, really? Uh, yeah, let's see if we can. And like it yeah. happened in hours. Like it just, yeah. there we go. Uh, let's see if we can figure that out. So, the idea that a player who wasn't on our radar, who wasn't someone we were out there targeting that just kind of stumbled into it mm -hmm. means that they don't still feel positively about Gabe Davis. It's crazy. Like yeah. having a chance to add some unbelievable to if we, you know, the same thing happened with Mike Evans or with some other like all pro level receiver, yeah. you figure out a way to make it work. You just do Absolutely. like, it doesn't mean anything bad. It's business, man. Yeah. Yeah. It just it is what it is. You know, it's kind of right. crazy, Greg. Um, we're we we're supposed to talk about some basketball, some other stuff. I didn't even get to talk about my worm farm. We're an hour in. When you and I get together, we can't just talk about bills. Yeah, it's our. All it's, we do is just talk bills, man. It's what we do. It's what we yeah. do. So there's a couple quick things here to to wrap it up. I know um, we are both having a little bit of fun with March Madness. We had an awesome uh, tournament contest for the Greg Thompson Sports Show. We had a great turnout. A ton of people joined it. Some really fun prizes are going to be given out. Um, so going through that, it, it's interesting. A lot of people have been riding with your, you know, your Yukon Huskies. I was one of them. I've been getting points this entire time, uh, being able to bring them along. Oh, I have yeah, Texas everybody. winning it all. Um, and right as the show got started here, I heard Alabama got knocked off. Another one seed got knocked off. Yeah. So now Purdue is out. We got Arizona is out. Marquette is out. Now Alabama is out. It's starting to get a little bit more excited. Uh, my, oh, did I hear? Did Houston get knocked out? Houston, I think. It, I was watching them before we went on. Oh, they, it yeah, was looking terrible. They were down by like twenty. Miami Hurricanes yeah. also. It was a bad. So, so many crazy. Dude, my my final four is busted. I have one path. <laughs> I'm. I was telling you offline. I'm in a. Uh, I'm in a one bracket with a friend from high school. It's a good bracket. He runs it. It's got a, a decent amount of money. That's awesome. Um, but I've been doing it for whatever, 25, 30 years now. And it, uh, I am my uh, final four is busted. I had Houston, Arizona, Duke and Yukon, but I've got Yukon going all the way. And I'm just riding out. I got to stay in this top 10 to 15 here. Yeah. Uh, and if Yukon goes all the way, I'm going to for sure win it. Cause nobody has them. And almost everybody's winners are out. There's very yeah. few people that have a path to getting the winner, uh, in this bracket. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the running here, uh, which hasn't been the case over the last few years. Yukon basketball has not been fantastic. I pick Yukon every year for those that don't know. That's where I start right <laughs> no in the middle. Way. Yeah. You I start there and work your way backwards. 
Dude, in my life, in terms of college basketball, in my lifetime, it's worked out four times. Yeah. I, there's not many teams that in my lifetime have more than four NCAA championships. Duke has five. Who else has more than that? In that time, uh, UNC yeah. might be in there. They have yeah. Like well, and even like some of the teams who were there all the time, like Michigan State, they actually don't have that many championships. Not many titles. Yeah, they're out in yeah. like the Sweet Sixteen all the time. Yeah, right? they make like, a lot of these good then, teams get yeah. to the Elite Eight consistently, but they don't yeah. uh, win the titles. UConn, sneaky elite basketball school. Yeah. Sneaky. Yeah. So uh, along those lines, uh, Aaron may not have had a chance to see these yet, but our, our wonderful producer, Chris, has had fun with my journey into hockey dumb and the Greg doesn't know hockey movement and trying to find fun things to quiz me on that I may not know. So he he made an effort this week to add in the trolling AQ edition of Greg doesn't oh, know. Man. So let's see where this goes. What are we trying? Is it? I, I don't. We're learning this together. We're learning this together. What is the lowest number seed UConn has ever lost to in the first round of the tournament? <sighs> um, it's got to be pretty bad. Right? I mean, so they've never been a. They haven't been like. Obviously, they never won a sixteen. They're not one of the two fifteens. Have they ever lost as a three fourteen? I was gonna say, uh, like a twelve seed. So like a twelve five. So them 12, as a five, five. moves into a twelve. Yeah. All right, we get a hint. Chris, he's he's a gracious. He's he's mean. He's cruel, but he's he's gracious. It's worse than a ten. Okay. All right. So okay. You, I'm gonna stick with twelve. I'm gonna stay with the twelve. All right, twelve. Um. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go a four thirteen. I can't. I don't remember, but I'm gonna go a four thirteen. That they were a four and lost to a thirteen. Thirteen. Hey, what year? Oh, UConn wait. lost the yeah. thirteen seeded. What San Husky Diego, team was that? Two thousand eight. Oh. Seventy to sixty nine. Two thousand eight. That's plus past Khalid El Amin, who's one. Oh of my yeah, that was ninety nine. One of my, one of my all time favorite college players. They he, won he, it he in 04. Like me um, Calhoun was still there. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of names. Yeah. yeah not a great UConn team. AJ Price was still there. The beat was still there. Oh, Hashim the beat. Kemba Lord. was a freshman. Okay. Okay. Um, so they, that does make sense. Cause they went on that Kemba run a couple years after that and got later. There. I, I, I won one of the years I picked that, that Kemba run. All right. So let's, we got one more here. Uh, just kidding. There's no second question. Look at that. <laughs> Your voice might lost to a bunch of Linuses. <laughs> Good work, Chris. Producer, it's Chris. true. I probably was pissed. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was, that I was, was for sure cool. steaming. Um, cool. the one thing that we got to talk about the uh, performance last night from the Kansas State guard, uh, oh. in the wild. fantastic performance. People, I think there's a little recency bias in that people are saying it was a better Madison Square performance than Kemba Walker in the um, Big East tournament. I don't know, man. Maybe on my bias of being a UConn fan, like, but Kemba in the Garden was like college basketball greatness. Oh, so, um, I will say, if you want to tell me, it's Chris Noel. Is that? How yeah, you, I think Chris, so. Yeah, Chris Noel. I think is. is I, I think it, like his his last name. I think is Noel, but it's spelled a little bit different. Yeah. Um. So if you want to tell me that his game last night, which was sick, like which was unbelievable in like, you know, assist turnover ratio, the amount that he Mark, Marquise, sorry, Marquise Noel. Yeah. Um, so if you want to tell me that that was better than any individual Kemba game, you know, the the. <laughs> Obviously, what he and the coach had worked on forever, like the fake arguing with the coach to set up the free alley oop. If you want to tell me that one game matches up or is on par or even better than an individual Kemba game, it was awesome. It was a really cool performance. Yeah. Anyone who didn't see, like Kemba rattled off like five straight Big East games, six tournament games, and 11 straight games where the team was on his back and he hit. What, game multiple like, game winners, just nightly like game four winner. game yeah. winners out of the eleven that he literally hit, like you know, uh, buzzer beater. So I, there's no way it's on par with that. But I will say it's the a individual cool, moment. It's really neat. He's fun yeah. to root for. So it, it's cool to be up there. But it's not, it's not on that level for me. I, I'm not a UConn homer at all, and it's not yeah. on that level. There is something special about Madison Square Garden. And guards, guards, guard guard, plays <laughs> in New York 
uh, city in Madison Square Garden just makes for some special occasions. Every yeah. time. And, and just to put it out there, like Marquise Noel, he, you know, seven of 18, so 20 points, 19 assists, yeah. five steals, 19 assists and two turnovers is like, that. that is historic. And mm-hmm. he's not like a, knockdown killer shooter but those two threes like the one that yeah. was like a 30 footer when they really needed it it was killer like I, I think it's cool to get excited about him and i think you know if you didn't have someone like um yukon already or i have texas i have texas winning it so i'm absolutely rooting for that this entire time if you didn't have that and you told me that marquise noel's story is what you're rooting for the rest of the way, I would 100% be on board. I would tell you, absolutely, that makes total sense. Rock and roll. Have a good time with it. Yeah, I just I feel bad for you. I think UConn's a team of destiny. Whether they won uh, 9 out of 10 or 8 out of 9 in the last games. Here's the thing, too. They're built in the right way. Big dude that can post up. Uh, a backup big dude that can just fill space. You need that in college. And then they got the... Um, uh, hard hat kind of swing white guy that can just get you some dirty turnovers and stuff. They, they got, they've got all the makings to go on the right yep. run. So uh, excited about that. And I hope my I'll face say, helps you win some money, Greg. Yeah. Well, and this next one is going to be really interesting because, you know, obviously Arkansas had knocked off Kansas, so they didn't have to play the number one seed when they got up there to the four. So now they do have to play Gonzaga. Gonzaga was a preseason uh, championship favorite. They still have, is Drew Timmy older than you? Are you older than Drew Timmy? Uh, why you got to bring up my age? I'm not going to talk about <laughs> But, you know, I think Drew Timmy's been in college for like a decade and he's yeah. somehow still there. He's like, le- legitimately, I think he's a sixth year super senior. Yeah. Um. So, like, that'll be interesting. That's a really experienced, talented team. Gonzaga feels like a, a we game. were talking about like Michigan State. A lot yeah. of these teams that are have a lot of hype, they're are like a one seed a lot and they just fade uh, yeah. in the Elite Eight or wherever. But what it's really going to come down to is you know, if Texas can beat Miami, which is no easy task either, Miami's been right. fantastic. Um, it's going to come down to a Miami UConn Final Four to make it to the championship game, and it's going to be my bracket against your bracket. So it I'm rooting be. for that now. I'm rooting yeah. for that now. All right. So one last thing uh, that we've had a good time with each week that we've gone through here is the worst. Who is the worst? Who is the person in your life that you see doing ridiculous things that just makes you feel like this? She is the worst. She's the worst person in the world. So we've had some really good ones. We've had some driving ones, people who don't use their turn signal, people who uh, drive slow in the passing lane, but mm-hmm. then speed up when you go to pass them. Uh, we've had some really good ones. And then the doesn't return their shopping cart uh, to the corral had been on a run here. They had won multiple in a row. We were actually even talking in the chat about, hey, maybe we have to retire them and, and bring somebody else in here. But this week, we had them beat by person at group dinner who demands everyone pay based on the percentage of each shared item they ate. This is the person who they counted the number of mozzarella sticks you had, and they want you to pay more because you had extra mozzarella sticks. It's wild. Um, I was privy to this information uh, prior to the, pro- the podcast. And I've never had this experience, Greg. One time, um, thank, one time in my God. life I've had it. I, one yeah. time I've had it and I was, so taken aback that he's like, well, I didn't have any of the uh, spinach artichoke dips. I, I don't think I should have to pay for that. <laughs> it was, oh, oh. Yeah, I luckily I haven't had any of these types of experiences because I would lose friends probably. I, like <laughs> my uh, my wife would leave dinner really embarrassed. Like, why <laughs> why did you go in so hard on them? Um, and I would have paid for everything and just like been pissed and left and stormed off. Uh, Cause that's ridiculous. Like you're going out to eat, you're going to overspend. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, just you, put it in an even way that makes sense for everybody for the value. Like no, that's not why you're going no, out. To we're eat. all just here. Yeah. We all spent too much money uh, yeah. on this. Let's not yeah. get into it. Yeah. No, those people are terrible. I didn't even. Yeah. Uh, uh, so here Eve talking about, Ooh, this vote is close. I prefer not to dine with assholes. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, I respect that. Yeah. Uh, Luke saying the shopping cart is an eye roll to a stranger. The dinner percentage is someone, you know, who is actively annoying you. So therefore I vote for the dinner jerk. I like it. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Kevin here saying, is the slightly disabled person a shopping cart left near a handicap spot is very helpful. So we don't need to use a, a cane or walker just to get into the store. Leave carts near handicap spots. It helps. I, I've never heard of that. I've never thought of that. I or, do or... think, though, you have to be careful of where you leave them by them because I have heard uh, I've had I've disabled friends that it, it can also be hard to get out of the car. So you got to okay. make sure that you're giving some space to get yeah, out, out of the way, right. not blocking where they would open the door. But this or does make like sense. That, but yeah. in the vicinity. I can see that as a feasible Stores thing. Stores should have more, maybe a couple. I was just going to say that. Like maybe yeah. the corral should be next to the handicap spot. Like that would be smart. Um, I don't know. I, I don't design those yeah. things. Yeah. Um, here, I hate lazy people more than I hate frugal people. So okay, I respect that. Fair. Uh, who the hell goes out to dinner with a wiener like that? Like I'm glad, like you said. Not, not Meg and I on the same page. Uh, here are uh, our... Uh, person who will face off with the group dinner splitter next week is from our very own Bruce Nolan, friend of the show. Uh, I have a nominee for your worst segment, the people who solicit businesses four minutes before they close. I know before uh, we got together and before you became a you know world famous graphic designer, you used to work in the restaurant industry. Was anything worse than the person who came in at 855 when you were closing at nine? Yeah, dude, I was historically an asshole. But sorry, if I, I don't know if I can swear on your podcast. I was historically bad at this as a manager. Uh, when I worked late shift, man, it, I had a policy of like, yes, we have a um, a closing hour, but we're gonna get you have about a twenty five minute leeway on that closing hour because we have to close down the kitchen. Yeah. Like, and it's a there's a legitimate process, yeah, and there's health dude, hazards. To if you never down close yeah. down a deep fryer or things like that, yeah. like that, you don't undo that. Like, no, Correct. I can't go drop you some more jalapeno poppers, man. Correct. And if uh, it, there's a certain operating costs, if there's uh, I, if it's the summer and I'm busy and uh, we're making sure. a ton things of money, I'm open all night. I'm a happy guy. Everybody can stay all night. We can, but yeah, if there's no cars in my parking lot, you roll in ten minutes before, like. I'll throw you together like something that I can throw in the microwave, but that's all you're getting. Yeah. And you're taking it with you. You're not sitting down here. <laughs> yeah. Like there's I'll make you a sandwich. To you're go. costing me money at that point. Like if it's a slow night and you're going in there, you're being an asshole. You're costing that business money. Yeah. Like be as if you have to stop and get some food, be as kind as you can. Other places, retail, I don't feel as bad. I've worked retail in the past. There's not as much. There's like, not that much. You got to close down your register. Yeah, yeah. There's not as much. You can get away with it. But restaurants. Don't, no, I would say don't go in and shop around at a no, retail No, if you got to go buy something. Yes. Go buy something to get out. Like I, I I, will do that. I will go to stores and be like, hey, is it cool if I run and grab something real quick? You know, because I know I'm just grabbing it. They're checking me out and I'm leaving. They're not going to clean up after me. They didn't have to get anything out to serve it to me. You do that at a restaurant, you are a bad person. So yes. I, I, I am going to predict this one takes it down and do might well. even go on a run for a little mm -hmm. bit here because a lot of us at one point in our lives, especially that 15 to 25 window, a lot of us worked food service and this person is the worst. Yes. And I will give anyone that doesn't understand or hasn't worked in that, uh, just a brief, a little tip, a dining experience at a sit down dining place is about a 40 minute experience. Okay. So put that into your, if you're going to show up to a place and you see that they close at a certain hour and you're not within that 30 to 40 minute range where you can have a dining experience, leave them alone. Yeah, half hour is a cutoff. Yeah, like, it, it, and if I'm with the family, I won't even do a half hour. If I'm by yeah. myself, I can, I know I can turn it. Sit at the bar and grab. I can like, sit at yeah. the bar and I can turn it quicker than that. And yeah, I'll yeah. even tell them like, "Hey, I know I'm cutting it close. I'll give you a good tip. I'm really hungry. Sure. Can you help me out here? I've had yeah. that. Um, so I, I've traveled for work uh, a lot. I've had those spots where like, "Hey, you're the only thing open, man. Like, can you yeah. help me out here? I'll take care of you. But like, you're the only thing open. And I'll tell them like, "Hey, what can you make me back there?" Mm -hmm. That you haven't already cleaned up and closed down, I'll ask. Be like, hey, if you haven't cleaned the grill, if you haven't, you're like, help me out here. What can I order that isn't going to ruin your night? But yep. I'm freaking hungry. I need something. Uh, one of cool, not to go off too far into the weeds here. <laughs> really, it ties into March Madness, though. One of my favorite moments as a uh, managing a bar and restaurant. Uh, it was one moment in the spring, not a busy season in Freeport, Maine. Spring's not busy. So we weren't having a real busy night. I'd sent a bunch of people home. It was me and uh, my chef. Uh, he was a Syracuse fan. I'm a UConn fan. It was Syracuse UConn. It was right. It was the uh, the game that went to whatever six overtime. Jerry McNamara, against Syracuse. The, yeah. the seven overtime. Dude, it was. 
we were like staying there and there was this guy who was at the bar. He was traveling on business from Illinois uh, and he was just there hanging out and I couldn't kick the guy out. He was a nice guy. We were like well closed and closing and I ended up making him food and we hung out and it just kept on going. Like some people were just hanging out watching. They were just like more and more people leaving as they went. But I kept that bar open until that game was over. And we even stayed and hung out after because it was just such an incredible experience that's one of those sports moments i know exactly where i was the whole experience of doing it and i was happy to keep the bar open that night even though it didn't go yukon's way what a fantastic game to just hang out and watch all night well i would say most of the people listening to this remember that game differently than you remember that game uh they they remember the the oranger side of that equation uh but yeah all time great all time Uh, crazy game so, all right, awesome. This was a ton of fun. Like you said, we can't get together and not talk for 100 minutes, because even when we try not to. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll be back uh, next week. I know we've been kind of goofy with our schedule for the Cover One Buffalo show. Uh, I appreciate season, Aaron making the time to come on uh, with us here and be able to give you guys everything that we're still looking for. Um, remember, you know, it, not that we don't need all the likes and, and ratings and reviews for Cover One Buffalo, because of course we do. But for a brand new show, it is even more important. It goes even further. It really, really helps out. So so if you have a minute to leave a comment, if you're still listening right now, leave me a comment in, in the uh, chat on YouTube or wherever it is to be able to let us know your favorite part of the show, uh, what you would do with the DeAndre Hopkins situation, how you think it's going to affect Gabe Davis, whether you would trade that Oliver, any of those things really helps. Uh, give us a like, give us a rating, give us a review. It goes a long, long ways. Really appreciate Aaron giving us some time here tonight. Uh, but uh, as we try to end every single week, we will have a little bit of fun and let... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen... The weekend. All right, guys. Try to find a way to be good to each other. We'll talk to you soon.